It's a great pleasure for me to be able to talk to you about Czesław Miłosz on the occasion of the centenary of his birth. I first met Miłosz shortly after he received the Nobel Prize when I was asked to write a profile of this recently quite obscure and suddenly very famous poet for the New York Times magazine. I subsequently had the privilege of meeting him on several occasions and enjoying his wonderfully energetic as well as erudite conversation. My favorite exchange with him came when he was about 85, and I was asked to sound him out on the possibility of coming to a conference in Amsterdam. I called him at his home in Berkeley, California, and explained what this was about. And he hemmed and hawed a little, and he said, well, you know, it is so far, and travel is so difficult these days. And then he said, I am not 75 anymore, you know. In his case, this was not at all a wistful joke. In his 70s, as in his 80s, Miwar seemed a person in full vigor and fully engaged in the world. And I think we should not forget the extent to which that vitality and joie de vivre, a kind of appetite and relish for the things of this world, fueled his poetic vision and is evident within it. But of course, his sense of poetic mission was also, or perhaps primarily, fueled by the turbulent and somber history which he had lived through and witnessed. Miłosz was a poet of many moods, but I am now going to read a poem which touches on one of the most somber events of all, the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. I will read it partly because it is a poem which has particular meaning to me but also because I think it gets at the essence of what makes Muir such an important and great poet. A poor Christian looks at the ghetto. Bees build around red liver, ants build around black bone. It has begun, the tearing, the trampling on silks. It has begun, the breaking of glass, wood, copper, nickel, silver, foam of gypsum, iron sheets, violin strings, trumpets, leaves, bowls, crystals. Poof! Phosphorescent fire from yellow walls engulfs animal and human hair. Bees built around the honeycomb of lungs, ants built around white bone. Torn as paper, rubber, linen, leather, flax, fiber, fabric, cellulose, snakeskin, wire. The roof and the wall collapse in flame and heat seizes the foundations. Now there is only the earth, sandy, trodden down with one leafless tree. Slowly, boring a tunnel, a guardian mole makes his way with a small red lamp fastened to his forehead. He touches buried bodies, counts them, pushes on. He distinguishes human ashes by their luminous vapor, the ashes of each man by a different part of the spectrum. Bees build around the red trace, ants build around the place left by my body. I am afraid, so afraid of the guardian mole, He has swollen eyelids like a patriarch who has set too much in the light of candles, reading the great book of the species. What will I tell him, I, a Jew of the New Testament, waiting 2,000 years for the second coming of Jesus? My broken body will deliver me to his sight and he will count me among the helpers of death, the uncircumcised. That was Poor Christian Looks at the Ghetto. This is one of Miłosz's best-known poems, but I must say that I still feel a kind of astonishment whenever I return to it and think about the extraordinary act of moral and poetic imagination it represents. Poor Christian and Campo di Fiori, his other poem about the Warsaw Ghetto, were written in 1943, either shortly after or perhaps just as the liquidation of the ghetto was taking its awful course. The poems are therefore among the earliest, perhaps the earliest, imaginative responses to what later became known as the Holocaust. Miłosz, from his position as a non-Jewish Pole in a war-besieged country, 
recognized that an event of surpassing horror was taking place behind the ghetto walls, and he felt sufficiently moved by or implicated in the suffering he witnessed to transmute it into poetry. This in itself, I think, implies a kind of strenuousness of consciousness and conscience, what Miłosz himself termed moral scrupulosity. But what I find quite uncanny in it is its visionary intuition that the project of obliteration will not succeed, that the guardian mole, the mole of memory and of history, will reconstruct the evidence of each life lost even from the luminous vapor of ashes. The period of the war was, of course, absolutely formative for Miłosz's sensibility and poetic vision. And the themes of this poem pervade much of his work. What is poetry that does not save nations or people, he wrote in another poem of survivors guilty witnessing. And I think Miłosz probably did suffer not only from a great pity and terror for what happened to Poland during the war, but also from a considerable sense of personal guilt, perhaps simply for surviving when he saw so many of his friends, many of them brilliant and talented, many of them poets and writers, die. Poetry cannot save nations. But against this helplessness, Miłosz counterposed precisely the force of memory in a felt poetic testimony. If one can, let him avoid compassion, that ache of imagination, Miłosz wrote in his six lectures in verse. The ache of the imagination marks his own poetry, both as a kind of cherishing of specific and ephemeral moments of beauty or fullness, what he called the immense call of the particular, despite the earthly law that sentences memory to extinction, and is a sterner pity and terror for the great injustices and losses of history. And of course, in his own life, he suffered many losses, and not only those proceeding from the war, sorry, okay. and not only those proceeding from the war. He first mattered to me as a poet of exile, about which he wrote without pathos or self-pity, and was an equal justice to the past which was lost and to the not always satisfactory present. Miłosz once said to me in a conversation that geographical distance increases the sense of distance in time. But in his poems of exile, that sense of separation is often transformed into a sort of fundamental amazement at the very fact that there is distance in time, and most of all at the transformation and passing of people and worlds and the passage of time itself. Against the sense of loss, the poignancy of disappearance, Miłosz counterposed again and again the power and pressure of memory a force which, in his poetry, is raveled with conscience in ways that, for all of our talk of uses and abuses of memory, may be hard for us to grasp. After all, he lived through a time when not only many of his friends and comrades perished, but when entire groups and communities were deleted from the record, and when the nature of such events was then willfully and mendaciously distorted. The summons to memory in Miłosz is therefore also a summons to historical truth. Memory, of course, cannot bring back what has vanished, and the note of inadequacy that can be heard in many of his poems is a gesture of a witness who has intensely cherished the physical world in particular moments and people, but whose powers cannot heal the raptures of death and time. But if loss in his poetry matters, it is because it is underwritten by such a strong sense of presence, a longing for things as they are in themselves. And part of the balance that he longs for, and that I think his poetry so grandly achieves, is a balance between this poignancy of specific attachments and an encompassing synoptic vision which travels with a sort of austere and accepting detachment
over great stretches of time, and finally over the whole fateful and ruptured last century. For me, if Miłosz is one of the great figures of literature, one of its voices of conscience, it is not only because of his stern and scrupulous judgments of human failings and the injustices of history, but also because he takes poetry to the edges of its possibilities, to the point of a fundamental philosophical wonder. I think it was a cause of great happiness to him to be able to return to his lost world, both through his poetry and in person. I happened to talk to him once, shortly after his poems were published for the first time in Lithuania, and he sounded as excited about this as if this were his very first publication. So I think we can only feel happy for Miłosz that history, at long last, allowed him to reclaim some of what had been lost, and grateful to him for his legacy of witness and contemplation and beauty.